We affirm contention warrants preventing an Israel-Iran conflict. Smith 18 explains offensive cyber operations allow for action within the gray zone of foreign activities, neither war nor peace. In this way, going cyber is pre-escalatory. And Valariano of Cotto in 2019 writes, cyber has become a substitute for riskier military operations. That's why Scotsman writes in 2003, Israel was preparing to take unilateral military action against Iran. Instead, Sanger of the Air Force in 2018 explains, the United States stepped in, convincing Israel there was a third option, launching cyber attacks on Iranian nuclear facilities. The attack, called Stuxnet, was a far more strategic move than a physical strike. Rosenbaum thus concludes Stuxnet may have averted a nuclear conflagration by diminishing Israel's perception of a need for imminent attack on Iran. Scott of George Mason University in 2012 explains that had the equivalent of the Stuxnet virus been carried out kinetically, Iran would have escalated. This is critical as Alexander 19 writes, Iran and Israel have a combined 90 million citizens who would be put in severe risk if such a war did start. Corpsmen of CSIS for the war, but Israel and Iran would seek to inflict the maximum possible casualties on its opponents and destroy its ability to recover as a nation. Our second contention is decreasing terrorism. <coughs> Rudisil finds in 2018 that in lieu of more traditional approaches to terror, the Trump administration has authorized the DOD and Cybercom to use offensive operations against global terrorism organizations, which have proved crucial in reducing terrorism worldwide. Hubbard of the New York Times finds last month that due to the U.S. pulling out troops from Syria and the Middle East, this spells the perfect storm for the resurgence of ISIS, and that uh, there is now a power vacuum in the region, destroying stability in the Middle East. This would be devastating as Caffarella finds that unless the United States continues its efforts to stop ISIS, its next resurgence would be more lethal than ever before. Fortunately, OCOs have been extremely successful at solving for terrorism, thus preventing a resurgence. U.S. OCOs are critical to fighting terror in the Middle East for three reasons. First is cutting off funding. Colorado <coughs> 19 explains that ISIS has diversified its portfolio to the point where traditional operations such as airstrikes are not sufficient to take out the funding. Critically, Temple finds this year that because ISIS changed the way it operates, the U.S. has already begun to use cyber operations against terrorist financing and it has been successful. This is important as Sales 19 finds it is enough to stop a gunman on the ground. The only complete way is to take out their financial assets. Second is compromising recruitment. Because of the low cost and the convenience of cyber warfare, Vita 19 finds that terrorists are shifting online for recruitment, funding, and attacks planning. And Page Proof as Basher finds in 2019 that in Bangladesh, a hotspot for ISIS recruitment where three-fourths of militants are recruited, 82% of militants were recruited online. Bait 17 explains that offensive cyber operations are used to bring down media platforms critical to recruiting, the reason why international recruitment for ISIS has collapsed. This is historically proven as Gavra 19 finds that the 2017 U.S. cyber attack on ISIS crushed their recruitment capacity, which took years to rebuild. Third is challenging capabilities. Gavra finds that the same U.S. cyber attack that halted recruitment efforts also damaged ISIS's conventional capabilities. She continued that the U.S. uses OCOs to push ISIS out of command posts and into allies' troop streets. Overall, because of the U.S. OCO's campaign, Roger 18 explains that ISIS has lost 98% of the territory it once controlled. Lamothe concludes that the cyber strike against ISIS has culminated in the destruction of the adversary on an epic scale, and that the military can only achieve exquisite effects like this with a force including cyber weapons. There are two effects. First is preventing a power attack on power grid attack on the United States. Charlton finds that ISIS has been attempting to recruit expert hackers to infiltrate Western networks, which Dawson finds would inevitably materialize in an attack on vulnerable U.S. power grids. This would be devastating as Private Fiend times that such an attack would cause a year-long nationwide blackout, which could kill over a hundred million people from starvation and cause total security <coughs> collapse. Second is reducing deaths caused by ISIS. Dudley finds in 2018 that in one year alone, terror groups killed almost 20,000 people, and this doesn't account for the deaths by the instability they cause. For the example, the Syrian civil war exacerbated by ISIS killed 500,000 people for these reasons. Everyone good? We negate. Our sole contention is escalation. Historically, the U.S.'s cyber policy has largely been defensive, developing offensive capabilities but limiting use to avoid escalation. However, Daily of CNBC 19 writes that new policies passed under Trump has shifted the focus of U.S. cyber operations to constantly engaging our enemies rather than sitting on the sidelines. This is extremely dangerous as Jensen of the Cato Institute 19 cautions that this divergence of U.S. policy risks upsetting the peace of the past and increasing the risk of escalation. This happens for three reasons. First is through inadvertent signaling. Jensen further said preemptive cyber warfare risks overreaction. Limited operations like espionage would be seen as a sign of the U.S. preparing to follow up with more offensive strikes. Others of national interest 19 further said countries who perceive U.S. operations as escalatory would be incentivized to attack the U.S. first to maintain the upper hand. Through the new offensive strategy, Ellers concludes that countries will be locked in permanent tit for tat conflict with the U.S. that could quickly spiral out of control. As our use of OCOs increases, the problem only gets worse. Healy of Oxford 19 writes that an aggressive U.S. stance on cyber operations would trigger a positive feedback loop, where countries would feel forced to create their own cyber commands, thus justifying a U.S. increase in capabilities and resources. Already, the American Security Project 19 finds that the use of OCOs will accelerate the cyber war with Russia until one side retaliates in a dramatic way to signal its resolve. 
Second is by revealing our strength. As the U.S. uses its offensive capabilities, we risk our weapons being hacked and used against us. This has already happened before. As shown in the New York Times in 19, right? so in 2017, the NSA was hacked, releasing a weapon called Eternal Blue. Since then, hackers from Russia, China, and North Korea have used the weapon to cause billions of damages, including attacks on American cities. Overall, historically, as we have shown our cyber capabilities, other countries are now incentivized to attack us and gain those capabilities for themselves. For example, Singer of Foreign Policy writes, when Snowden leaked the United States' offensive cyber capabilities, attacks in the U.S. increased by 55%, with severity also increasing. Once countries have these weapons, they can use them at zero accountability. Douche of CS Monitor 17 writes that countries like China and Russia outsource their operations to large groups and companies, allowing them to launch large attacks and deny responsibility for any harm caused. Aside from state actors, Jones of Financial Times 17 finds that through black markets, leaked weapons can quickly spread to unwanted groups and nations. Even worse, after being attacked, the United States would lash out at perceived perpetrators. The DOD 15 writes as non-state entities and proxies launch attacks in the U.S. would make it harder for the United States to identify the attackers, spiking the risk of miscalculation. Third is by ending cooperation. By constantly using offensive cyber operations against other countries, we decrease their incentive to cooperate with us. Muslington to the CIG 18 finds that because cyber weapon capabilities are hard to gauge and are used to directly confront other countries, they corrupt cooperation by breeding mistrust. Fairly Council on Foreign Relations 15 for those that rules for cyber engagement can only be formed if the U.S. limits its ability to use operations that contradict their own demands. Clarifying cyber conflict is crucial. As InfoSec 18 writes, absent clear guidelines for cyber engagement, countries will be uncertain in terms of how and when to respond to cyber attacks. They conclude that this ambiguity really greatly increases the risk of conflict erupting as cyber engagement becomes more aggressive. The impact of cyber conflict in two specific ways. The first is on our infrastructure. Straw by the Scientific American in 2019 corroborates that because cyber attacks have the ability to destroy infrastructure that is vital for providing necessities like food, water, and energy, the effects of a cyber war can quickly jeopardize life for millions. Indeed, the University of Cambridge finds that just one cyber attack in the U.S. power grid will leave 93 million people in the dark and cause hundreds of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of damages to the economy. Second is on our financial institutions. Additionally, because of rampant escalation caused by use of offensive cyber operations, Politico in 2019 writes that the financial industry is preparing for U.S. banks to be hacked. Bassani of CNBC in 2018 writes that because the global economy is largely determined by the success of the U.S. market, a major cyber attack that would collapse our financial systems <coughs> will quickly spread around the world. This is crucial as the IMF concludes that the next economic shock would push 900 million people into poverty worldwide. Thus, we are proud to meet it. Yes, sir. Uh, on your second impact about recession, right? Yeah. If economy, like if the global economy is interconnected, why do countries have an incentive to attack the financial sector? Yeah, that's like saying because people die in a war, no one wants to get in a war. Our argument is that since escalation occurs, there be there becomes a certain level of degree of attacks that triggers these types of events, like things like infrastructure and things like recessions occurring. So we're not saying, obviously, the incentive for a country is not to get into a conflict. What we're saying is that the United States' current posture invites these countries to get into a conflict in the first place. That leads to escalation. Nice. That's fine. Yeah. So on your side, uh, what's my on your uh, connection with ISIS, you say that when troops left the region, that is the real reason. That's like the reason that's why ISIS is going to research. Yeah. So, are troops the most significant factor then that are causing ISIS to decrease? Uh, no, we say that OCLs would be the reason for the. But decrease. if troops are the, if troops leaving is what's going to cause ISIS to just like come back again, then that means OCOs aren't the real reason. That's why ISIS is being so stopped. We say, troops so we say that empirically OCOs are what stopped ISIS, and since troops have sure. pulled out of the region. It allows ISIS to research. But, but we say when we use OCOs to stop things like so funding and recruitment. That just means that offensive cyber operations just by themselves don't work. Uh, we would say they do on links like funding and recruitment. I know, but if you if you read evidence that says troops leaving is going to cause ISIS to research, and we're using offensive cyber operations right now. No, it just says, it doesn't say they're evil. It says they have the, they want to because it creates a power vacuum. So, okay, you can finish the question. All right, so like on this like inner burden signaling, right? If we've been using OCOs, for the last like three years, like what is the bright line for this? So you say like yeah. any like you say like any offensive cyber could trigger this. So first of all, we started in 2018, not three years ago. But the second thing okay. is the American Security Project evidence is very specific in saying that escalation isn't just this one-time event and then boom, there's going to be a big attack. Okay. It's a buildup of over time. So that's why the evidence says that like we're in a cyber war with Russia right now and we're creating the seeds for conflict. That eventually there's going to be one side that's going to retaliate in a big manner because they miscalculate or misperceive a certain action and that's going to trigger a catastrophic attack. Oh, yeah. Um, on your first contention, right? Mm -hmm. You said that in, two, in 2003, uh, Israel wanted to go to war with Iran. Yeah. But then you said Stuxnet reassured them, but Stuxnet was in 2010. So within <coughs> those seven years, why didn't Israel attack Iran? 
uh, because they didn't see the need to. But when Why? they saw like when they saw Iran increasing their nuclear capability, that scared them and pushed them. Yeah, but from 2003, you're, the evidence we, the evidence you read says they wanted to attack Iran. From from 2003 to 2010, they were developing nuclear capabilities. Okay, we no, we say so, there's there's like there's always going to be like tensions between Israel and Iran because of yeah. ideological differences. But we say like Iran was reaching the point of nuclearization. So what stopped nuclear them from attacking 2003? Because it was an offensive cyber operation. We'd say they didn't fear Iran's nuclearization. At but you you read the evidence that says they were going to attack Iran, but we reassured them. And then the, your evidence for reassuring them was from a cyber operation in 2010. Yeah, which is seven years later. Okay, that's fine. The evidence says they were planning to. Just because they were planning to doesn't mean we they were planning for planning like, to wait for the, seven years. The warranting is that their fear of Iran nuclearization. That's why they were going to attack. That's why stuff's now off. Okay. Uh, just like okay, it's an overview then down the case. Is that really long? No. No. Like two parts. As an overview, Bill Clause 17 explains that states like Russia and China killed decades of cyber negotiations at the United Nations in 2017 because there was no incentive for them to come to the table. They believed that the West had more to lose if there was no retaliation against cyber attacks, and they wanted to avoid the perception that the West could dictate cyber norms. Critically, CARP buys the only way to get states like Russia and China to the cyber negotiation table is to make sure they have something to lose, which occurs when the U.S. increases OCOs. This, one, takes out their personal because info sharing and international agreements mean that there's no risk of adding inadvertent strikes. But two, it reassures states that they won't attack each other on a large scale. But three, it acts as a release ball for all types of escalation because the council created and can always intervene which is uh, intervene with defense which takes out their entire case but then let's go to their first thing about inadvertent signaling right off the bat inadvertent signaling takes out uh, they takes out the risk of escalation because if countries don't know the implications or attack or the potential of cyber attacks then they have no reason to escalate and they don't know what it's going to do or they don't know like where it's coming from they're not going to launch a re response in the first place this is why we haven't seen inadvertent signaling happen in the past but then they say Trump passed a new policy but Bogart in 2019 writes that the 2018 DOE cyber strategy reflects a shift to a posture that is more active and our analysis also would imply that the United States engage in adversaries in cyberspace more assertively without provoking escalation dynamics. The first application of defend forward concept was used to take the Russian international agency offline the days preceding the 2018 midterm election and provides evidence that the United States can engage more directly. Essentially, what this means is that even though we're using a more particular policy, the policy is one that will decrease escalation and instead increase cooperation and defend forward is able to protect our critical infrastructure. But then second of all, promoted the Department of Defense in September explained that cyber requires an offensive strategy. Defending forward allows the government to disrupt threats at the initial source before they can cause harm. Essentially, you will always prefer capability, uh, capability over intent. Even if actors want to strike the United States and we knock out their capability first, it does not matter. And critically, this builds our tools, skills, and experience needed to, uh, to de uh, detect, locate, and exploit threats in the cyber domain. Overall, all of the cyber operations are necessary for defense and want to be effective. Essentially, if you want to have strong, uh, strong, um, strong defense and able to mitigate the effects of things like anti-American sentiments, we need to build up OCOs with that built up our defense. But then, even if you don't buy that, realize they have to win a link into, a link into escalation. But what Stanford University in 2018 writes is that cyber security is de uh, cyber offenses you have cyber operations are de escalatory in nature, meaning most nations perceive them as, de uh, as a method to decrease, uh, com de decrease um, the amount of attacks. Let's go to the second link about revealing our strength. First of all, this argument is reliant on leaks, but you can turn this against them because reverse engineering and leaks allows the U.S. to build up their own defense because they can patch up holes in their system and, and gain experience. Moreover, Gorman notes the U.S. employs white hat hackers to reverse engineer U.S. capabilities to protect things like, like protect things like critical infrastructure. This means that one, U.S. deterrence gets stronger in the long term because cyber security appears stronger. But two, even if people want to retaliate, the U.S. can protect itself, significantly mitigating all of their impacts. But then also, realize reverse engineering is something that will be patched up in the long term. If the U.S. realizes that reverse engineering is a problem, then they're probably going to be more careful with their code, and that's why we have to do something after. Wanna cry back in 2017, and we haven't seen the impacts of reverse engineering actually materialize. For example, take the Wanna cry attack. There was no actual terminal impact of the Wanna cry attack. There were no big financial intrusions, and there was no power grid attack like they talk about. But also, uh, that cyberspace expands just beyond the U.S. Things like digitalization make the whole cyber domain essentially non-unique. In fact, what Lake Bloomer finds them after Russia and China sold weapons systems to other countries, they reverse engineering technology because other countries will always have an incentive to ramp up arms because a part of their geo geopolitical uh, geopolitical uh, decisions, but also because digitalization happens. This means and they can always reverse engineer other capabilities. But then realize that reverse engineering capabilities is further, it gets worse in the, like, it's harder to do in the long term. Because even if people want to attack the United States, if we A, build up our defense through OCOs, then we're able to strengthen that, but B, we keep our code most secret because it's developed. But then on the third, on the third link about adding cooperation, voting from increases direct cooperation, two warrants. First, if countries fear they can get stomped by the US and cyberspace, then they have a tendency to negotiate with the US and certain nations to prevent getting stomped. But second, the use of OCOs comforts other countries. As Barnes explained, that the US gives other countries a cyber capabilities running them from adopting their own and alienating themselves from the US. But also, 
world. Their only way for the cooperation is to be a leader in cyberspace. If the U.S. takes this role, there is an ability to come to concession on issues. This is why the New York Times just a couple weeks ago finds a 27 country signing agreement of the rules and regulations within cyberspace. This is two locations, one. All their arguments for cooperation. So, it will just be frontlining his rebuttal and then going to their case. All the judges good. Let's start with this overview about negotiations. As last they say that we use OCOs who can coerce other countries into joining agreements and norms inside of you. There are two problems here. Number one, we should already be seeing these norms being created. And so far, as China continues to hack us and their hacking is increasing in the status quo, and we're escalating with Russia in the status quo, obviously, norms aren't working with our enemies. The second problem here is that the Jewish evidence says that these countries can give their weapons to third parties in order to get around norms in the first place. So even if they agree to norms, the norms aren't going to do anything. Then, let's go to our first link about inadvertent signaling. They drop a couple terms. The first thing they say is that countries won't watch it, they don't know they're being attacked. No, that doesn't respond to the Elders warrant that says that our, our, our OCOs are perceived as a user lose situation where we're trying to take out their capabilities. So countries do not care about whether it'll work or not. They feel forced to use the cyber weapon because they feel they're going to lose the capability. The second thing they say is that defending forward is going to work and it's going to take out other capabilities. But number one, this relies on a trade-off existing where it said hey, we have to put more money towards defense. But as far as the Woodcock evidence indicates on offense is so cheap, they're just going to spend more on offense and more on defense. There is no trade-off existing. But number two, the RCD evidence writes that U.S. operations are to take out other people's capabilities, number one, take too long, and number two, are too extensive that they can't effectively take out capabilities. Other countries can always adapt, which is why their new strategy is working. Then, the last response on our first link is from Stanford evidence that says that it's perceived as non-escalatory, but the Dillian and the Jensen evidence from our uniqueness says that because the new shift is towards a more offensive approach, we're consistently engaging them, countries perceive now that they have to escalate, they have to use back, which is why this idea that now we're defending for strategy is a giant hypothetical, it's really just not working. Then, on our second link about leading the tool chest unlocked, they drop a turn about reverse, reverse engineering. They say that we can just patch it afterwards. So that first of all, that's just saying like we should get nukes so we can figure out how to better against defend against nukes. The logic makes no sense, but number two, we don't patch anything, which is why the eternal blue example that we give in case it's still attacking our economy and we are still losing billions each year then we th at that point we're looking at pretty clearly our impact our financial systems impact basically goes dropped into rebuttal that when when we see it attack on our financial system causing a worldwide recession pushing 900 million people into poverty let's go to their case on the first contention israel there's a giant contradiction that they concede in crossfire the fact that their evidence about israel fearing iran was from 2003 but when we reassured them the attack that they said was in 2010 in those seven years israel should have gone to war that means that israel has other centers not to go to war for example they don't want to risk it destabilizing the whole region, they're never going to go to war. The second thing here is that Stuxnet and other attacks on Iran are the reason why they have a nuclear program in the first place. For example, the independent right says Stuxnet actually proved vulnerabilities in Iran's program told them to how to fix it and make it more efficient. But second, <laughs> Lasso writes that their OCO on Iran forced them to give up on diplomacy and double down on their nuclear program. The reason why this is important is because if Iran did not have a nuclear program in the first place, this entire contention would not matter. There's no incentive to go to war with Iran if they did not have nuclear weapons. Finally, we'd say escalation prereqs because if we escalate with Iran, they're much more likely to escalate and if Israel will feel to go to war because Israel will not go to war and take out their capabilities unless they need a full-scale war, which is why in a world, in their world, they're going to go to war with Iran, whereas in our world, they, have, they cannot take out the capabilities. Then, let's go to ISIS. First on base, their New York Times evidence is conceding the entire argument insofar as the Fox evidence indicates that the reason why ISIS has lost 98% of their land is because of the military. What that means is that the idea that OCOs are doing anything is completely irrelevant. It makes no sense why OCOs are doing more than our military on the ground. But then, on their links. First of all, the New York Times writes that our uh, ISIS funding sources are really diversified. For example, they're selling a lot of goats. We can't hack goats. We can't take out their funding sources. But second, what we saw in the recruitment argument is that their Bashir evidence concedes that there's still a ton of materials online, which is why the recruitment can never end. That's really critical. But number two, we'd say that the reason why the, the operation, we saw a decrease in recruitment afterwards after the operation, the Washington Post writes was not because of OCOs, but rather because we take out key military personnel on the ground. Then on the third warning about capabilities. First of all, their evidence is talking about taking out their digital capabilities, not physical capabilities, which is critical. Because what the New York Times writes is that after we OCO, uh, ISIS, they just moved to other servers, which is why they will always just adapt to our OCOs. We cannot permanently solve the issue. Then on their impacts of power grids, they say that they're going to attack our power grid. First of all, if this was true and they had the capabilities, they should already be doing this in the status quo. But second, the douche evidence says that we can give weapons to third actors. Other states can do that, meaning we control the internal link ISIS getting the weapons in the first place. On their second impact about ISIS says, we say we outweigh on recession for two reasons. Number one is the Times evidence that writes that in recessions, we have to pull our military out of regions because it costs too much, meaning that if the military is the biggest reason ISIS is decreasing, then we control a better link into solving for ISIS. But number two, foreign policy writes in the world worldwide recession that increases the incentive to join terrorist groups because when we have a recession, people need jobs and ISIS is willing to give them that job in the first place. That also means that they have to win their funding leak in order to win any offense because with ISIS and limited funding, they can always just buy new equipment and always fund more members to join. So let's talk about the police revenue. It says that Iran doubled down its nuclear program. So what type of uranium did Iran produce? I'm not like a nuclear right. scientist. Low enriched uranium. No, I'm pretty sure it's high. It's in low enriched uranium. uranium. But the regardless, the also, their evidence the, also says that okay. they developed capabilities to get to that nuclear weapon, and it concludes that they wouldn't even be on the path if they hadn't doubled but down. But what does low enriched uranium do? 
Okay, I don't know. It's it probably nothing. It can't produce nuclear armor. weapons. So if it can't yeah, produce sure. nuclear weapons, so, why does that turn our argument? Okay, so actually the way it works, right, is that if you have the capability to develop low enriched uranium, uh -huh. then eventually you can get to the higher state. Because it? the reasoning is that you have to recruit the same people to do both processes. So for example, if I get nuclear scientists to do low enriched uranium, then I'm also going to be able to use those scientists for high grade uranium. But it's, but it's also the infrastructure right. and it's also getting around. But That's why whenever we perceive yeah. countries as even doing low enriched uranium, we also perceive them as eventually going to get to nuclear weapons. Yeah, and they're pretty close to getting a nuclear weapon. All right, sure. Yeah. So let's talk about these, this like norm stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like the term. So what countries is your 27 countries talking about? I'm sure you can tell. Them. It's talking about like how it's like yeah. Canada, right? Yeah. So like, of course they're going to listen to like what we tell them to do, right? Yeah. Sure, okay. but that cyberspace is pretty like ambiguous according to your case. We're just saying that if countries come together and sign normative agreements, that creates a safer cyberspace. Because okay. if other countries, like obviously if 27 countries all have the same rules and regulations, so Russia and China right. look really bad with like acting that's, our road. That's also not true. Like international like criticism doesn't work on Russia and China. But like your 27 countries are just countries that are all allies and are have like very limited cyber capabilities, right? That's fine. But so one, I would say the deterrence gets stronger is it's 27 countries coming in a coalition. Two, it still proves our argument. How is that deterrence? Cyberspace norms in cyberspace still remain the same. We're allies right. with countries that use cyber operations. Right, but I'm talking about the countries that are being aggressive with cyber ops. Yeah. Have they agreed to these norms? Okay, no, not yet, but we're saying they're going to the future. Wait, what? When? As per the overview I read. Can Wait, I why would they agree to it though? Because, because the they, they will have, have something to lose. Wait, what did they lose? Because if the US uses OCOs, they can attack Russia and China. Can I have a question? Uh, sure. Okay. Let's talk about your second link about like reverse engineering. So what yeah. is eternal blue delta? It's not reverse engineering. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's revealing strength. strength. Revealing our strength. Yeah. No, it's like, there's like a difference, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah what's we'll, we'll yeah. up? Yeah, so what is Eternal Blue done? What is Eternal Blue done? Yeah. It's uh, cost our economy hundreds of billions of dollars. So like, what does that translate? No, no okay, what has what it done? Like, what? Like, it, that hundreds of billions of dollars isn't like a... Wait, like, what? What like, do I do with that? Like, well, how many jobs have lost? How much like, people have been affected? Yeah, sure. And I think that's just an example of the fact that these weapons can do financial attacks, and then we give the impact that the, a major financial attack could cause a recession worldwide. So why, that, why, why hasn't people. another U.S. OCO been, like... Yeah, sure. So I can give you like the time frame analysis, the implicit evidence, which you draw says that the risk is going to increase in the future as the rules get even more dangerous, as we become more aggressive. Okay, so if we win rules, then we win this. Because no, no, it's, it's not safe. If rules get it's safe. It's not rules. It's even just being more aggressive and fighting it to be responded. Okay. But it's also like third parties get access to it. All right. All right. So wait, wait, on third parties, Rick, really quickly, yeah. just to clarify. So the, this still like the bigger countries have to give them the third parties, right? Huh? Like bigger actors have to give them the third parties, right? Well, also on our second link, we say that when we reveal our weapons, they also get leaked to the black market, which they yeah, can but it has to be leaked by the bigger actors, right? No, it's like they, they can take it from us. Okay. Yeah. Can I see like the can I see that third party assets can directly take it from us? Like the weapons get leaked to the black market. Yeah. For everyone to access. Yeah, 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 I can do that. Okay. Um. Yeah, we're just gonna be down the app case. Uh, then I'm going to do some playing, uh, then down the neck. All right, is everyone ready? <laughs> Start off on the top, go to the go to our contention about Israel. We'll concede that countries don't want to risk destabilization. There's no risk of conflict in the Middle East between Iran, Iran and Israel. Now go to our second contention about care. They say that uh, ISIS diversity, and the problem is that Kalamachi postdates this, that we say that ISIS is shifting cyber right now. That's our uniqueness, and that's why the only way to take out their funding is through OCOs, because when we take out their funding, we take out the root cause of terrorism because they no longer have funding. But go to our third link about uh, go to our third link about capability. The problem is they say it's because of the military. But we say that OCOs enhance the military. That's how they're able to take out the command post. Because when we give information to our allies, they're able to find the command post and take out the in, like take out the command post themselves. They say that ISIS moves to other servers. The problem is servers don't matter when empirically we've taken out 98% of their physical land. We'd say that always comes first because if they don't have land, like servers don't matter in the long run. Okay, then go on to our impacts. We say we're going to extend the Syrian civil war. We say that when ISIS resurged, they destabilized the region like during the Syrian civil war. And this leads to 500,000 deaths. They say that recession is a prefect. We say that the U.S. still always has an interest in terror. That's why they fight it during times of economic downturn. And we say that terrorism hurts economies in the Middle East. So by solving for economies in the Middle East, we help stop these recessions. Now going to their case, the easiest way to vote is on the overview. They say that we should have already seen these norms. The problem is they can see at the bottom that 27 countries have already signed agreement. We say that absent OCOs, there are no agreements. They can see that Russia trying to destroy these agreements. That's why we need OCOs in the first place. They also can see that there's they fear something to lose. That's why countries like Russia and China come to the table. We say this solves for their two links. First on inadvertent signaling. We say that when negotiations happening, there's stuff like information sharing. So percent Perception no longer matters at this point because when you information share, you know exactly what a country is doing and you don't fear the aggression. Secondly, on strength, we tell you that uh, 
we tell you that when there's a negotiation, they have to win escalation, and when you have co-ops, there's no incentive to escalate. But now, go on specifically to reverse engineering. They can see that the longer we use OCOs and the more we use OCOs, it's harder to track. This makes reverse engineering harder in the long run, and it makes it harder to vote off of. Now, go on to the impacts, Judge. You're going to refer us first on probability. We say that terrorists has a 100% probability because empirically we've stopped terrorism. Well, they're, they're like... Their case is super muddled. We never know when these attacks are going to happen. You're going to refer us also on time frame because ISIS is attacked, like trying to research right now. These impacts like never trigger. They never contextualize when they do. Second, thirdly, is on clarity of impact, Judge. We are a very clear impact. We tell you that terror has led to destabilization in the region, and OCOs have stopped this. Judge, they need to like explain how, how much escalation has to happen, how much, like how, how severe these OCOs have to increase, and how bad the attacks have to be for their uh, impacts to trigger. We tell you it's very clear on our side with the 500,000. Uh, fourthly, is on severity. We say that the U.S. economy is extremely strong right now, so they can check back for economic impacts, while the Middle East is extremely destabilized because of terrorism. That's why they need the U.S.'s intervention. <coughs> um, maybe starting off um, on their second contention. Is that very good? Start from your second contention. They can see the bot response that says that the reason why 98% of the reason why ISIS has lost 98% of its territory is not because of offensive cyber operations. It's because they're boots on their ground. They say that OCOs are really good, but their own hard evidence concedes this because their own hard evidence in case says that when we pulled troops out, that was the real risk as to why ISIS was going to resurge in the first place. So the reason as to why OCOs is decreasing right now is because of troops in the first place. If we win the prerequisite analysis as to why troops get pulled out, then we also win the internal link as to why ISIS is going to resurge. Let's go to the prerequisite analysis. The first thing is time evidence. They can say that the United States always has an incentive during the recession, for example, during 2008. The United States had to do internal stimulus packages, so they lost the revenue to actually keep the troops in the first place. So even if the incentive exists, the capability goes away. So we say that specifically, like our evidence is specifically 2008, that they decreased the amount of troops and the military forces in the region. That's why, uh, that's why, uh, like, uh, like terrorism resurges. But the second, because uh, again, troops are important. But the second thing is they drop the second prereq analysis. It's just when there is a global recession, people need a sense of security, so they're more likely to go to terrorist organizations because ISIS provides things like security to security them and things like jobs. So terrorism increases during times of economic downturn. If you win our second contention, uh, our, our uh, link in escalation, we also win this argument. Let's go to our case. At the top, they say that their the norms are being solved right now, and that the only way to get countries to the table is if you have to give them something, if you threaten them with something, and they say that, oh, 27 countries have signed on. Number one, they don't say what these norms are, what specifically these norms have done. Number two, that evidence is talking about all our allies. Obviously, countries like Estonia and Canada and Switzerland, the, the countries that their evidence talks about, are be signing norms with us. We're literally allies with them. But third, they adopt the juice ev douche evidence that says that countries like China and Russia, the people who are being aggressive towards us right now, can give these cyber operations to third party actors. Essentially, they can just agree to the norms and be like, hey, this private, co like, hey, like the United States can be like, hey, this private company's attack me, but China and Russia are like, oh, Wait, that's not me. It's just like someone, like, I don't know who they are. That, that allows them to have possible deniability, which means no one's actually solve in the long term. But then, let's go to our first link. They say that, oh, we can have, we can find each other's capabilities, so the long-term incentive, like, in, like, escalation decreases. They drop the arrows evidence. Because the United States has openly come out and taken this preemptive offensive cyber strategy against other countries in the region, their, their incentive is, like, whatever, their, their, like, decision calculus is whenever the United States responds to them, they're in a use it or lose it situation. If they don't do anything, the United States is going to take out their capabilities, so their incentive is to not just sit back, but try to escalate back and try to get the United States to back down into conflict. That's why they're more likely to escalate, not just sit back. That's why the AMS, the American Security Project, evidence goes conceded. It says that China and Russia, these countries are on track to having a huge cyber conflict in the long term. The Healy evidence says it's a positive feedback loop. The more aggressive we get, the more incentivized other countries are to be more aggressive and develop their own capabilities, so escalation increases in the long term. But then on our second on our second war, they say that if it becomes easier to like track our capabilities uh, and like it becomes like easier in the long term for reverse engineering decreases anyways. Number one, this isn't implicated as to like why it necessarily means this escalation decreases in the long term. Insofar as they also read defense as to why reverse engineering those things don't actually lead to any significant impact and have not led to significant impact, we say our first war matters more. On the impact level, they can see the link into the recession. The political evidence says that financial industries are preparing for hacks, and the Pasani evidence says that one major hack will push 100 million people into poverty. On the way, they have 100 percent probability, but their link is riddled with so many alternative reasons as to why their link has actually come true. We say our impact is much more, has a much higher strength of linking to actually occurring because we isolate specific scenarios. That's why escalation occurs. They say time frame matters more, but they, they, don't, they don't even have a time frame to their argument. They just say that ISIS is going to attack in the long term. But again, insofar as we control the interlink, we also control the interlinks in the time frame analysis because we say escalation is happening right now. Insofar as we give you specific warrants and analysis, that's why it's going to happen in the future. You prefer our argument. Nothing. Okay, so I guess, like, so let's talk about the impact on ISIS, right? So the impact you go for is that ISIS is like, in the region, right? Mm -hmm. And the impact is that, like, ISIS has, like, been oppressing people, right? Sure. 
Okay, so how do we OCO solve for that? Like, what's the link you go for? Uh, by decreasing access to this funding. Okay, so if they lose their funding, then what happens? If they lose their funding, they aren't able to fund their operations, and then they can't carry out attacks on Wait, but ISIS doesn't just go around Syria, like, attacking people, right? Like, yeah, what is the funding being used for? What is the funding being used for? Weapons, like, getting, like, recruiting. Like, this isn't domestic. I mean, that's like a test. Okay. Okay. So, all right, so let's talk about your case. All right, so Russia and China are interconnected with the United States, right? Yeah. Okay, so if they're interconnected with the United States, what incentive do they have to, like, so sure they can be increasing attacks, but what incentive do they have to increase attacks to the point where it causes So I guess, like, first of all, this wasn't in summary of rebuttal. So it wasn't summary. So David says that there is economic interconnection. So it's terrorist no, it groups. Doesn't. Terrorist groups but, like, watch I mean, attacks. So attacks. first of all, that wasn't in summary. But, like, also, the fact is that Jewish evidence gets dropped that these weapons can go to third parties. Okay. And, and also, it is, for the third party so that they really quickly, that, all that stuff doesn't matter because, like, the argument we're making is that escalation occurs, yeah. right? And obviously, like, there is some sort of sense that, like, if I go to war with someone or there's my infrastructure gets damaged, it's yeah. obviously a reason for me not to get into conflict. Uh -huh. But our link extension, our narrative we're going for is that, like, the, our OCOs invites escalation, creates a breeding ground for that to happen. It does not, menace, it does not matter if they perceive that it's going to hurt them as well because, again, it's a user loses situation. Yeah. They perceive that if the United States gets more aggressive, their only alternative and the best option for them yeah. is just to be aggressive back. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so on your second contention on uh, terrorism, yeah. right? So your box, the box on this is not I, like it's not give a specific isolated example or isolated like impact to OCOs, right? What do you mean? Like so, like the evidence that you said has decreased by ninety eight percent just says that OCOs played a role. Yeah. So a couple of things there. First, there was a coalition formed, and OCOs are part of that too. OCOs enhance conventional capabilities. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, okay. But, but so like, the reason the reason that's why that like this is, doesn't necessarily matter, right? Is like absent our ability to do offensive cyber operations, you're not proving how much more ISIS would grow or how much harder it would be to stop ISIS. Okay. Our evidence is really quick in saying that offensive cyber operations were needed for like the only. No, 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 so your the evidence the whole, just like, says the evidence says that the only way to achieve exquisite results like this is to use OCOs. No, no. You just told me that OCOs just played a part of a coalition of tools being used, right? No, but it doesn't. Countries, not tools. Okay. That's fine, but in comparatively, you're also saying that OCOs combined with like conventional forces, right? Yeah. But you never tell me how critical OCRs, OCOs are in order to those conventional forces to make them more. But evidence like says like you need OCOs. But like in order for <laughs> you, 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 and you can't you can't extend this 500,000 impact unless you prove absent absent our ability to do offensive cyber operations, ISIS would have grown this much more, or ISIS would have killed this these many more people. Okay. Like because you can't access all 500,000 people. Like because your argument isn't like if we didn't have OCOs, ISIS was just like like we'll just come back immediately, right? Sure. So your impact is contingent on how much they would grow absent I OCOs. No, not necessarily, because so you can't load, access all the evidence is really quickly than saying that the only way they can achieve these efforts is with OCOs. Yeah, but that isn't doing the comparative that if we didn't have like, like, yeah, yeah, we like, would be able to stop ISIS. We would have access like a significant portion of that. So. It's a uh, pro con. Uh, all right, we good? It's starting on terrorism. Our argument about funding is functionally conceded in summary. Remember when we tell you that right now ICE is looking to diversify its funding in order to go to the cyberspace. But what we tell you is that specifically we've used often cyber operations as of this year, which postdates their evidence, indicating they're using more OCOs to knock out their financial assets, which stops them from recruiting and stops them from doing anything in the first place. The honor tells you that's the root cause of terrorism in the first place. And this is really important. And so and even if there's conventional weapons, one, we enhance the conventional weapons. Two, they don't tell you what conventional weapons to do. But three, realize that OCOs are critical in that role. The Lamode evidence is functionally conceded throughout the entire round. We say that OCOs are the only way for it to be possible. Possible. That's why we are getting access to 500,000 lives. They gave you this prerequisite analysis. One, it's contingent on them winning their impact. We would say that but before the time of recession happens, we can still go and intervene and stop terrorism. But two, even if that is true, realize that they, we, they, cannot, they cannot short circuit what has happened in the past. Empirically, terrorism has already gone down, which means there's still a reason to vote for us. But even if you buy that, realize we want to cooperate with our allies, and that's why in times of economic downturn, we turn to them and support them. And this is why we tell you that and this is this is gonna this is gonna this is gonna there's a reason to vote for us. But then let's go on to David's way. The first reason you're gonna vote for us is on time frame. You don't know what kind of attack they're going to talk about. Honor, uh, Atreus said that it's not wing. It's not like, it, there's no time frame. But realize, for escalation in small businesses, what well, remember what David tells you. Make them prove to you what escalation needs to occur, how many small businesses need to be attacked in order for the impact to trigger, or when it's going to happen in the first place. Our evidence is explicit in indicating that ISIS is looking to research now, but the only way to combat them is through a continued use of offensive cyber operations. But also, realize that we outweigh on severity. Things like the U.S. economy can really be bounced back from, but instability in the Middle East is something that takes decades to come back from, and that's why we tell you that terrorism always comes first in today's round, even if you believe we have a 
you're risk assaulting for terrorism, you will always vote for us. Let's go to their first link about inadvertent escalation. The first thing that matters in this, the first thing that matters here is even if countries have any user or lose the situation, that doesn't take away from the economic interconnectedness. Countries are reliant on each other. Attacks affect one another. That's why we empirically tell you there's no reason for them to escalate and no reason for them to attack. The user or user is just a predictive analysis. It doesn't make no sense. It doesn't make any sense. And there's no warrant there. But even if you don't buy that, realize as the US, as the US develops its OCOs, it's able to help. It's able to help its capabilities. And we said that increased cooperation, even with 27 countries, it expands in the future. And when cooperation expands, we also that it comes to things like Russia and China preventing their impacts from recession occurring. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it'll be starting on their case, then going to our case. All three judges good? Sounds good. Cool. A trade history response from Fox that says the reason why ISIS has lost 98% of their land and all their power in the region is because of our military being on the ground. They say that we don't give a warrant as to why the military is good. We give their, their own evidence from Harvard that says that the military being pulled out is the reason why ISIS is resurging. That's 100% probability that the military is the reason why ISIS is losing in the status quo. Meaning that since that evidence goes conceded from their own case, that means we control the fact that A, their impact is not unique. We don't need OCOs in order to take out ISIS. And number two, if we prove the military presence goes down in our world, then we're winning a bigger link into ISIS because obviously the military is more important than OCOs. Then on the trade-off style stuff, he makes a bunch of new responses in final focus. They're not even responsive. For example, he says before the recession we can attack them. They themselves tell you ISIS is an attack that we need to keep attacking again and again. So if we have a recession, we can't keep going. But number two, they say that we can work with allies. This makes no sense. We need to be on the ground. Of course, the United States is the biggest presence in the region, meaning if we win true pullout, we win their weighing as well. They even on their weighing. They do a lot of weighing. But insofar as number one, there's alternative causes for why ISIS is decreasing. They cannot access any of the weighing. We don't know how much high from they're exiting or how much of their magnitude. But number two, insofar as the prereq gets conceded basically in final focus, especially the foreign policy evidence that says that the reason why people join terrorism is because of the economic downturn, that short circuits all the weighing they do. We control the link into ISIS. Let's go to our case. The only response on our first warrant about warrant is that countries rely on the economic system in the status quo. The problem with this is that Treyas says in his summary, the reason why this response does not respond to the argument is the Ehlers evidence that indicates that when we were trying to take out their capabilities, countries perceive it as preemptively and are forced to use it or they feel like they're going to lose it, which is why even if there's an economic harm to themselves as well, they have to launch a weapons or else they're going to lose the capabilities, meaning that even if they don't want to, they still have to launch a weapons, which is critical because our link goes conceded and our impact does as well. We say attacks on our financial system would cause a worldwide recession by killing banks and moving the data and making it impossible to move data from bank to bank, which is why the IMF concludes that an economic shock would push 900 million people into poverty. Then, finally, they give a norms argument that 27 countries are joined, but Atreus says in his summary that these countries are all allies and are not enemies, which means they don't link it to the impact because countries like Russia and China are the ones attacking us, meaning that they can still launch attacks. But second, the third party's uh, uh, response to the uh, uh, norms also gets conceded that they can give to third parties to engage on their own norms. Thank <laughs> you.